Summer officially arrives on Tuesday, and one of our traditions here on Weather World as the seasons change is to check in with our resident astronomer, Dr. Chris Palma from the Penn State Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. He's also Associate Dean for Undergraduate Students mm -hmm. in the Eberly College of Science. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you. Always good to see you. So, as I think about news in astronomy the, the last few months, I keep coming back to advances in observing the yes. universe. Can you give us an update on that new space telescope, the James Webb Telescope? Yeah. The first thing I learned about space telescopes is how strong they have to be. The, the environment of space is incredibly harsh, right? So, so all sorts of preparations have to go into hardening the telescopes. So NASA just let us know the telescope is doing great, but it did get some damage from a, a small particle that impacted it. The good news is they told us it's still in good shape and they're really expecting it to perform beyond its expectations. Okay. Because this telescope is so far away from Earth, it cannot be repaired, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. And now I understand there's a new Earth-based mm -hmm. telescope called the Vera Rubin Observatory that's in the works. Tell us about why that will be significant. Yeah. Well, James Webb is in space, and, and space telescopes are always complemented by ground-based telescopes. What I'm really excited about scientifically from the Rubin Observatory is it's going to get us frequent observations. So it's able to take images of every object on the sky in the Southern Hemisphere every three days. So over 10 years, we're gonna get day after day after day, very quick data. So we'll be able to tell if astronomical objects are changing on daily, weekly, monthly timescales. And often when we have that new type of data, it lets us discover new phenomena that we never knew existed before. And what is the time scale on that being ready to operate? It's a, li a little bit, you, you know, the schedule might slip, but we're expecting it in the next year or so. Okay. Let's uh, switch, as we always do, to some of the interesting research going on in your department. I saw a story about sunspots, mm -hmm. those, those dark patches on the sun that have about an 11-year cycle. Mm -hmm. There was a time hundreds of years ago, though, when it seemed like most if not all of the sunspots just disappeared for a long period of time. And now there's a possible explanation for that? Yeah. Well, we always have to be careful about explanation, right? <laughs> um, but, but that behavior of the sun, where it was documented that the sunspots went away, has not repeated in the hundreds of years since. So when you're trying to look for solutions, what went on, you need more data, right? You need other examples. So the sun hasn't done it. But we've been studying other stars year in and year out for about 50 years now, and we discovered another star that is just going into that same type of cycle where the, the sunspots have died out completely. So if we continue to monitor that star until it comes out, that will help us understand why that star behaved that way, which will hopefully also tell us why our sun did the same thing. Right, and I presume we wouldn't call them sunspots. We'd call them star, star spots. spots. Okay, yep. got it. If there's one astronomy topic that I think captures people's imagination, it's, at least for me, black holes. Mm -hmm. And I saw some new findings about the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Yeah. What's the latest there? Yeah. Well, I mean, black holes absolutely captivate people. But the issue with them is they don't give off their own light. So all the data we have on these black holes is always indirect, how they affect their local environment. So we, we have this wonderfully beautiful image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, but what we're really seeing is the gaseous environment around it. And what's really interesting is that it mimics very much the one that we saw in a distant galaxy, but that one is a thousand times larger. So even though the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way is much, much smaller than this other one, they work exactly the same way and most importantly, they both seem to behave exactly the way Einstein predicted when he came up with the theory of general relativity. So consistency between black holes mm -hmm. and consistency with the theory. Exactly. Um, closer to home, I also saw an interesting story. There's been a, a new development in this search to document mm -hmm. all of these near-Earth objects that yeah. could potentially hit the planet and cause a problem. Tell us about that. Yeah. So the, the development is, and, and this is a, a, the type of research I really enjoy, we've talked about new telescopes coming online. Well, this does not need a new telescope. We have decades and decades of archives of observations that have been done where we were trying to study a given object over here, a given object over there, but those images captured many other objects that we weren't interested in. 
So what researchers have been doing is going back into the archives using modern computer technology to pull out observations of asteroids that were in those images and just never cataloged before. Okay. And so with that technology, we're finding many more asteroids than we knew before. So these images were used for other purposes, mm -hmm. and now we're just repurposing them. Exactly. We have about a minute left. We always like to close with some sky watching tips. Mm -hmm. I understand right now, if you're willing to get up early, <laughs> there's quite a planetary yeah. show yeah. going on. Yeah. So to see the planets, right, you have to remember the planets are all orbiting the sun. So for them to be visible in our sky at night, they have to be at least in that other half of their uh, path around the sun away from sunlight. So right now, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn are all uh, in that right part of the sky to be visible around 5 a.m. Okay. But if you get up that early and you look low in the eastern sky from, from the east through the southeast, you're going to see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn all aligned in an arc. Venus and Jupiter will be the brightest and will grab your eye. And as soon as you find those, look for the slightly fainter Mercury, Mars, and Saturn all in a line. So Mercury will be at the bottom and probably mm -hmm. toughest to see. Yeah. Dr. Chris Palma from the Penn State Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Always good to see you, Chris. Thanks very much. Thank you. And we'll be, we will be back in a moment with more.